Hello YouTube, Mr. Report, and Tudor subscribers. This is Terrell from Terrell03.com. Today is October 13th, 2020, and this is a newsletter report for newsletter number 17. This newsletter program is about helping people see God's wisdom hidden in plain sight using God's three witnesses of spirit, water, and blood, testifying in the Holy Scriptures from Genesis 1, 1 through Revelation. Once you see the three witnesses, it changes everything. And some people think this avatar of mine, it was picked up in 2009, before Project Black Star investigation ever started. This is really an avatar of God's three witnesses. You can't see the blood witness yet because the spirit witness and the water witness have yet to come together. So this would be similar to whenever the earth was made formless and void, and darkness is on the face of the deep, when the heavens and the earth was still separated. This is just before the conception of the begotten blood witness. For those that have been um, have read my book, those of you reading my book, The Mystery Explained, you've gone through the introductory videos here at tarot03.com. Start right here. We're going to start fixing your doctrine. And it looks like that my uh, web page isn't acting properly. Well, anyway. Start with these six introductory videos. When you become a subscriber, you'll get a copy of my book, The Mystery Explained, connected to be attached to your uh, notification email, and you're on the path to seeing God's wisdom hidden in plain sight. <clears throat> Pardon me. So this is from uh, this is for Trevor, and this was really written last month. Been that far behind in uh, getting the mystery report update. I've been trying to get at least one a month out and miss the month of September. My apologies for that, but I'm going to get two done for October and get back on get back on plan. So uh, he had a, uh, a death in the family from his uncle. And so we correspond on that a little bit. And he's thanking me for that. And then um, I hope that you saw the link I sent and added it to your list so others can research Rothschild's plan. And for me, the power of the House of Rothschild, that's that's the richest um, family on the planet. And they, they, are, they run the global bankster cartel. They're in control of the global intelligence community. They're in control of the global military industrial complex. I mean, as all powerful as that sounds, for me, the power in that family originates in the garden with the serpent. It's been around for a long, long time. So he has a question, and he'd like my thoughts on a few passages regarding the sweet odor or the sweet aroma. <clears throat> Pardon me again. I'm having a little difficulty today. Um, to God and the significance of the true meaning if you know the meat. Please compare the book of Enoch, chapter 24, to 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. Thank you, Trevor. So, in my reply, thank you for writing, the book of Enoch, question mark, is not a part of the 39 books testifying as the spirit witness of God's living word. There are many books that, that we can have this argument all day long about the books that should be included and should not be included. And for me, then the 66 books of Scripture follow the, the rules that God has established in his numerology. So it's no coincidence to me that there are 39 books in the Old Testament and there are 13 blood witness books in the New Testament and 13 blood witness books in the New Testament, the kingdom books in the New Testament. This is a diagram from my book, The Mystery Explained. Old Testament books, Paul's epistles, 13 of them. Kingdom epistles, 13 of them. There's one book in the Bible that is unique to all the others, and that is the book of Acts. The book of Acts has features and characteristics of a water witness ministry and a blood witness ministry. It is the transitional veil in the New Testament between the water witness and the blood witness. So you have the spirit witness in the Old Testament, 13 books times three, because all three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water are unfolded together. 
It's the only, then we have the water witness that came first, the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom epistles. Prophecy being fulfilled. That's what John the Baptist did when he stepped through the veil. Established by Malachi 4, 5, and 6, the last two verses. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the children to fathers, the hearts of the children to fathers, and the hearts of the fathers to their children, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Final word, Old Testament. Curse. And then, I mean, you, you can start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but I like to start with Mark, where John the Baptist just trots right out. And Elijah confirms, I mean, J Jesus Christ confirms that he's Elijah. He's trying to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies, but the water witness that came first was made last. So Christ makes reference to that. The first is last, and last is first. He mentions it several times. And this is one meaning of it. There are <clears throat> Pardon me again. There are many uh, places in Scripture where the first is going to be last and the last is going to be first, and it's a reference to the water witness that came first that's always put behind the blood witness. That's why the body of Christ is being built today, part of Christ's blood ministry, and the water ministry is going to begin once we're taken. And this is the same exact pattern as the tabernacle of Moses in the temple. The same image of a man. I'll show you that. We're going to go to ChristianForums.com, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to skim through some of the topics there and give you my views on them very quickly once we get through with, with uh, answering these things for Trevor. So there are reasons that the Book of Enoch is not included in here. The 30, the 66 books and these 39 Old Testament books, they're the canonized version. These are God's witnesses. That's His Spirit witness. It is a layout of the temple. It's also a layout of New Jerusalem. It's a layout of heaven. That is incarnate inside of us. And it's a blueprint of us. Spirit, blood, spirit, soul, and body. Of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So once you see these patterns, and I've seen them since, since I was young, and I'm in my 60s now. So the, I can see them, and this stuff is all second nature to me. And... Some people might think that, you know, this is Looney Tunes and stuff like that. And I'm like, great. I hope you keep seeing it that way because I'm running the race to win. And once you see the three witnesses, I can't tell you how many people have helped to see it over the decades. Once you see it, it changes everything. You're like a calf out of the stall. Heels clicking in the air, running down the road to see these things. It's really exciting stuff. Trevor is ahead of, of a lot of many people. <clears throat> Pardon me again. I apologize for my... Uh, that's my allergies. So, we're going to get right to 2 Corinthians 14 through 17. And that is going to be chapter 2. Left the 2 out there, didn't I? And you can see it here. Okay. So, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of knowledge of Him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. To one an aroma of death to death, and another of aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincer sincerity. But as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Since you are asking for the meat, reserved for the mature, the sweet aroma of knowledge and wisdom of him, hidden in him, passes through each Christ's body member, conveyed from the facet, each peers through, as if we are standing around a precious mystery jewel, where all of God's sons are testifying simultaneously. God allows me to see through a particular facet, to share what is given to me about his wisdom, his hidden wisdom, which God does for you and all of our brothers in Christ. All of God's sons must testify from their varying perspectives, which releases the sweet aroma of knowledge of him in every place, in heaven and earth of Genesis 1.1. -1. You've heard me testify of the knowledge, or you've heard, you've heard me testify of the angel song, 
released from God's Word incarnate in us, from all the collective spirit, blood, and water witnesses from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation and everywhere in between. So I mentioned that. A lot of people ask me questions about that. But whenever you grow and to know what each witness of the Bible is and their relationship, that's the key, the relationship. Because some water witnesses are spirit witnesses too. It depends on which relationship that you're talking about. So Adam, for example, is a water witness in relationship to Christ, who's the blood witness, to God, who's a spirit witness. But Adam is the spirit witness in his relationship with Eve, who is the water witness. You see, so what you have is a, you have God's living word that's the only living and active document on the planet with testimony coming from these witnesses. And when you know the identity of each witness and his testimony and you realize who's a spirit witness, who's a water witness, who's a blood witness, then uh, everything starts clicking. Get that synchronicity thing going. And you hear this testimony come from Elijah and this from Christ and this from Moses, the three witnesses of, of transfiguration. And you hear Adam and you hear Eve and you hear the Lord God who is Christ, the, the Lamb of God testifying from the garden. And you hear these things and as, then as everything comes together, like it's cinematic, then you hear that, that testimony coming from each one because each water witness of Scripture testifies about all the other water witnesses and the blood and spirit witnesses that are in their little family, their little mystery set. All the blood witnesses, whether it's the Son of God or heaven or your soul, the holy place of the tabernacle, all are blood witnesses, all are begotten. They're all testifying at the same time, like all the spirit witnesses are testifying at the same time. Whenever you, whenever you get this and you see it in the, through the eyes of the new man enlarging in your heart, then you begin to hear it. It's like a chorus that's singing. And that it is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's like, it's like the tree of life is inside of you and is growing from the inside of you. And you hear the testimony collectively of all the witnesses. And it's just really, really a miraculous thing. And, and the scripture itself will begin to interpret itself. And I know how that sounds. Somebody says that. Whenever you see the truth of God's hidden wisdom through his three witnesses, then all these things begin making sense. And it's as if we all already know these things already. And as if God is giving us the gifts in things that were already ours. So it's not that he's giving us these heavenly rewards. It's that we're getting things that we've, or, we've already earned. We're, we all know each other in the infinite realm. This world is like a matrix. Inside of the matrix, which is heaven. And the only realm that is real is the infinite realm where we're all gods. So, from the mature perspective, knowing, because I've, Trevor, we've known each other for a while. You've been, you've sent me a lot of questions. Then, when you, you are receiving the meat part that many of you that are just starting the journey that, you know, you're not going to get it as much. But when you, when you go back, this is number 17 in the, in the series. Right, so when you start with number one, by the time you get here, then it's going to make a lot more sense than it is if you if you're just being exposed for these things to these things for the first time. So God has shown me things through a facet, and I'm showing them to you. The day is going to come when you have to turn around and show me what God has shown you through the facet that you're looking through, because we all look from a different perspective at the same mystery jewel through a different facet. So, um. The angel's song that is inward is the inward representation of the song revealed to and through heaven and earth from the Lamb's throne and from the sea of glass that permeates everything. Make the connection to this sweet aroma of knowledge of Christ, translated into wisdom by maturity of the host, and the song coming from the central administrative hub of the universe described in the verses below. To see what I mean. This is, this is uh, Revelation from Revelation 15. Then I saw another great and awe inspiring sign in heaven. There were three, oh, I'm sorry, there were seven angels with seven plagues, and these are the last. 
for with them God's anger is brought to an end. Then I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire. Those who gained victory over the beast, its image and the number of its name, were standing by the glass sea, holding harps from the Lord. They sing the song of Moses, God's servant, and the song of the Lamb. There's a song of Moses that those that are standing on the sea of glass, those kingdom disciples, those water witnesses, are singing. And there's a song of the Lamb, that the, that's the blood ministry, that's us, that's the body of Christ. We're kings, we're rulers, we're judges. We judge the world and the angels. Peter, John, and James don't do that from the sea of glass. They're in a completely different household, completely different dispensation. It's one of the reasons you start off understanding the differences between the two Gospels so you can separate the two churches and see that they belong to different dispensations. Then you can see what part of God's Word is written to you as personal mail, and then you can recognize the personal mail written to uh, to Israel of the flesh, for example, and to the kingdom bride, because they contain instructions and commands even for them that do not apply to you. Paul has the Lord's commandment. He has visions and revelations from the Lord. Even our gospel was given to Paul by, quote, unquote, revelation of Jesus Christ. It wasn't known in the four gospels. Let's see so many um, ministers, professing experts, Bible prophecy experts, saying, well, Jesus said this, and Jesus said this, and the Bible says this, and the Bible says that, but every word of Scripture has to be interpreted. And because Jesus said it to Israel doesn't mean that it applies to you. Mixing kingdom doctrine with grace doctrine defiles the quote-unquote wisdom given him, Second Peter 3, 15, uh, 14 through 16, to your own destruction, to the warnings about mixing the water and blood together, and that's what going through this exercise in my book, The Mystery Explained, is going to help you to stop doing. It's going to help you to fix the broken doctrine. Stand upon the truth of grace doctrine given through the Pauline epistles. And a lot of people think that Paul is a heretic because he teaches things that are contrary to what's taught in the four Gospels. He does that deliberately because when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, he gave Paul what's for us, the body of Christ, the Gentile body of Christ. He was giving different things to Peter, John, and James, water witnesses, priests. The gospel of the kingdom is the gospel that Israel rejected. That's not the gospel we preach today. If you go to Matthew 24, verse 14, he says that the gospel of the kingdom will go to the whole world, and then the, then the end will come. That happens at the end of the age. That happens after we are gone and Elijah comes to restore all things. They're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom. We preach the word of the cross. That's different. If you don't know the differences, you're mixing them together. So, with that, the way, how that applies here is the Song of Moses is being sung by Peter, John, and James. Those are that are on the Sea of Glass. I didn't pull up that diagram for you because it's right down here. Okay, this is one of the more complicated diagrams when you get later in the book. So they start off really, really simple. They start off like this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is for the new people. Spirit witness, blood witness, water witness. This is the key for breaking God's true Bible code. Three witnesses are throughout the Bible once you understand their relationships. And then they begin speaking. Turn this on its side and you have a man. The man of God. God has his own three witnesses. God to come, God who is, God who was. Revelation 1.8. So in the beginning, Genesis 1.26, when God says, let us make man in our image, God who is, is speaking to God to come, his prophet, and to God who was, his priest, saying, let us make man triune. The family is man, woman, and seed. The man is spirit, soul, and body. Our image is triune, spirit, blood, and water. The number of man is what? Six. One plus two plus three equal six. Six is the number of man. For that reason, because spirit witnesses, blood witnesses, and water witnesses throughout the Bible have their own numerology. 
ones, twos, and threes. Add them together and you have the number of man, six. A little background information. You see then later you begin to see that God's word, remember I showed you before, it has a spirit witness and it has its blood witness and its water witness. That's the same pattern as everything. The same pattern as the in inward parts of you and this creation. They're everywhere. Once you see the three witnesses in God's word, then you begin to see it everywhere, all around us. So God is doing the same thing in heaven. This is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit equal Christ Jesus. Only Paul mentions Christ Jesus in the scriptures as the heaven, heavenly man. Heaven of Genesis 1.1 is Christ Jesus. Heaven of Genesis 1.1 is the word. Jesus Christ is the incarnation of the Lamb of God on the earth. The Lamb of God is the incarnation of heaven, of Genesis 1-1, standing in the center of heaven of Genesis 1-8. I know that sounds complicated. That's why these things are laid out in diagrams, like this. So, the sea of glass, see that's just words in, in, the, in Revelation for many people. Once you go through the diagrams and you see it, how important it is, it explains a lot of things. The body of Moses stands upon that sea of glass. They're the water witnesses. We're the blood witnesses in Christ. And then once you see that there's a song of Moses and there's a song of the Lamb, who is the Lord God, take it to Mount the Transfiguration. You're going to realize there's also a song of Elijah. It's just not mentioned. You learn about it through the types once God's Word grows inside of you. And the this body of Elijah is the angels. Peter's over here, John and James, and their angel half is over here. They're yet to be reunited. They cannot be reunited until they go through the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's whenever their angel half and their man half are reconnected. Those of us in Christ Jesus are already restored. Our angel half is already put back together with us. We're already seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's up here. We're way ahead of the game compared to those who are coming by works. That's going to make Israel jealous by design. So the sea of glass is the water witness side of the Lamb's throne. That has a fire side behind us where the angel half of Peter, John, and James are testifying simultaneously. Even if the song of Elijah they sing is left out of the spirit, blood, water equation. So you, can see, you can see the Lamb, you see Moses. You recognize the Lamb of God is the Lord God who made Adam and Eve in the beginning. Then you begin to realize after a period that Moses, Moses' name means drawn for more than one reason. Because Moses is the water witness from the original Garden of Eden. Another skin for your mother Eve. I know how that sounds. She was put in the cleft of the rock. Lord God put the hand over and removed the hand because that's the same hand that drew Eve from the side of Adam, the same one that drew Moses. So you're seeing God's word and having God's word incarnate in us provides us the knowledge relating to the body of Moses and the body of Christ throughout the Pauline epistles. But wisdom teaches the body of Elijah and the visible sea where the angels testify on the opposite side of the land's throne, adding their voices to the symphony. So scripture is multi-dimensional once you begin to see it with the new eyes of the new man that's inside that's growing inside of you the sweet aroma of knowledge is taught from the smelling perspective while the lamb song testifies from uh, to the same knowledge and to some wisdom hidden in Christ from the hearing perspective so that's what's happening throughout the passages is that you're, this information is being conveyed but through the sensory, through the senses. Wisdom teaches that God's knowledge and wisdom radiating through the sons of God released to pass through each heavenly host to the ends of the universe as all the hosts are connected where God's knowledge and wisdom are conveyed to and through each host like the life blood coursing through our bodies. We will emerge from God's heavenly temple shining like the sun 
for the light to be conveyed from us to the heavenly host that brightens their bodies that glow, like Moses' face coming from behind the second veil. So they turn and testify to other heavenly hosts, causing them to glow from exposure to God's light, transformed into sweet aroma, sweet heavenly song, so on and so forth. So our death to death testimony for our brothers testifies to the death we died with Christ on the cross by obeying the gospel to the death of our fleshy deeds translated into spiritual death deeds by following the Spirit. The life to life testimony to the wicked testifies to the life we once had separated from God in the flesh made us just like them. Having only one nature, the old man, dedicated to a sinful existence versus eternal life we received as a free gift for obedience to the gospel through which God chose and called us. The wicked collectively sing their song from the lake of fire, testifying to God's wrath and condemnation heard by the sons of God on our day of visitation that from God's perspective encompasses the past, the present, and the future, translated through the beast incarnate within their souls like the Son of God testifies through the sons, children of the daylight beheld by God's mighty angels. Before I read that verse, and this diagram is put here to help you understand <clears throat> There's a lot of questions about the rapture right now. A lot of, you know. And um, I'd listen to some commentary. My significant other likes to listen to Paul Bagley and Stephen Benoon and, you know, people like that. And um, so there's a lot of talk about that, what's going on. The thing to realize that there is a, there's a rapture of the righteous and there's a rapture of the unrighteous too. Like I was saying earlier, God's word is multidimensional. So when God is teaching us about the mystery of Christ, he's also teaching us about the mystery of iniquity at the same time. So there's an antithesis doctrine for the mystery of Christ. So as, for example, we are the members of Christ's body, like they are the members of the Antichrist body. So we're baptized into Christ and into his death the sons of disobedience are baptized into the Antichrist and into his death. That's coming in the lake of fire. But we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Finished products. Ephesians 2, start at 4. They are seated in the lake of fire in the beast right now. They don't even realize it yet. So when the rapture happens, then we're going to take, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. We're already there. We're already seated in those heavenly places right now. From our perspective here in the lesson that we meet him in the air. It's above where we are now. At the same time, the wicked are going to be poof, raptured too. And they are already where they are going to. So once you grow in the maturity in understanding that how God's word is laid out, how it's a living thing, and how it's incarnate inside of you. It really is. Heaven is incarnate inside of you. And you're going to realize what I'm saying right here as you mature that for everything Christ, that Paul is teaching us about grace doctrine, for the body of Christ, there's an antithesis doctrine. So then, so these words, Ephesians 3, it's one of my, whenever you first start off as a new babe Christian, then generally Romans and uh, Romans 8, it's like the most magnificent thing since sliced bread. As you mature more and more, then you're going to be migrating over to the Ephesians and Colossians, the, 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 the prison epistles, and uh, the deeper things that are taught later. So the um, Paul's letter to the Romans is is a little more comprehensive. It was written earlier. It was written in 59 AD. The final three verses were added after the close of Acts, after 61. That's why there's two amens there. There's two endings, verse 24 and 27. So um, that was added to the 
the manuscripts circulating through Antioch, but not the older Egyptians. They, the Egyptian, the Byzantine manuscripts are already gone to Egypt. Paul couldn't update those, but he updated the ones in Antioch. That's why there's a difference between the received text and the, and the critical text. Anyway, the um, this is a this is a key verse. And as you're growing up, then you're going to realize one day that God is using us, the Jews and the Gentiles, being gathered together like two little herds of goats, like the story in the Old Testament, that destroyed the, all the enemy in the whole countryside. He's using us to teach a valuable lesson to eat to God's mighty angels. So this is what he says. He says, and you could just start back at Ephesians 1. It's, it's, one, it's one, some of the greatest words written by Apostle Paul, my, my view, where he goes on about the dispensation of God's grace and the mystery that was given to him. But then he's going to, when you get on down to verse 10, then he says, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church, that's us, Christ's body members, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Really, really great stuff. The bottom line here is that God in spirit is continuously testifying in Christ in us and through us for the collective testimony to be sent through heaven and earth, part of the restoration of all things. That has been God's purpose for the ages and the reason for creating heaven and earth for the restoration of just one Son of God that we know as Adam and one member at a time in Humpty Dumpty fashion, until together we sing the same Lamb's song from the center of the throne. At the same time, our song tells the story of doom, condemnation for the wicked in the lake of fireside of heaven, of the heavenly equation, I should say, teaching God's mighty angels that God's grace is greater than all the works of men and angels combined. That's what God's doing with the members of Christ's body, gathering us and choosing us by, through the gospel by His grace and making us mighty. God needs us to fill the heavenly places about to be vacated by the devil and his minions about to be chained. He's going to drag them down, chain them all down, close the top to the bottomless pit and keep them there for a period. And the, Elijah is going to come and restore all things. He's going to teach, he's going to preach the gospel of the kingdom and teach kingdom doctrine. No more Pauline doctrine, no more grace doctrine. All the preachers that could possibly preach our gospel are going to be in heaven, looking down from those heavenly places, helping Elijah restore all things for the next 3,000 years. That's what's about to happen. So the things that are going to happen in Matthew 24, so many people think that Matthew 24 is being fulfilled today, and it's not. That happens on the next Black Star Orbit cycle. When the Black Star comes the next time, the Black Star comes to start the day of the Lord and it comes to end the day of the Lord. Paul's destruction from 1 Thessalonians 5 is about to happen now. It's going to be a May, fall, I mean, springtime event. At the end of the age, they are going to see the sun turn dark because that's after the Black Star reaches perihelion. Our event happens before the Black Star reaches perihelion. And when you analyze and and check out every single thing, then then you're going to see that that's the reason Paul doesn't say that the sun's going to turn dark or anything like that, because our event happens in May. Then this is a article that uh, a video that that Sean sent in, and this fellow was talk. A lot of people think the tabernacle, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Rapture are connected, and they're not. The only unfulfilled feast for Israel is going to be fulfilled at the end of the age. We're living in a mystery time that the prophets could never see. So here, here again, the Bible is laid out in three witnesses of spirit, blood, and water, just like your body, just like the temple, just like the tabernacle of Moses. And this is a timeline. Old Testament times, our mystery time. And then the kingdom period that comes after that. So the prophets standing in the Old Testament, they can see into the day of the Lord really, really good. Daniel keeps talking about the end of the age, the end of the age, the end of the age. This is what Zechariah is talking about. This is what Joel is talking about. What happens over here? 
None of them see what happens in, in between these two veils. Second veil, first veil. The people back here, they don't see what's in this period. If they can't see it, they can't prophecy about it. There has not been a prophecy fulfilled from God's word in almost 2,000 years. Put your hand up if you think I'm a heretic for saying that. I'm sure a lot of people think that because they're listening to what's being passed around as knowledge today and truth is such a rare commodity. Everybody is mixing the water and blood together. They don't know the difference. Separating, you have to rightly divide it. That means separating the water witness, the day of the Lord, the fulfillment of prophecy from the revelation of the mystery. That's what the Mystery Explained is all about. Help you understand and separate the mystery, our mystery gospel, from the gospel of the kingdom. Our mystery church from the kingdom bride. We're not the bride. How many times has Paul used the Greek term numpy in all of his letters? Bride. Zero. He never calls us the bride once. He calls us the body over and over and over and over and over again. Peter, John, and James are called the bride. John, what is it? John 3, is it John 3, 29? The bride. He who has, the bride is the bridegroom. That's whenever people are being born again. We are not born again. We're a new creation. People that are going around saying that I'm born again, born again, they don't understand. That's John 3. Christ hasn't died for anybody yet. That's repentance and water baptism. They're mixing the kingdom doctrine in with grace doctrine without knowing the difference, which Paul warns and says is distorting the wisdom given him, which they do to their own destruction. So, I know people like to throw rocks at me for sharing the truth. But this is what the truth is right here. There's only one of them. There shouldn't be 20,000 different denominations. It's one of the reasons I stopped trying to fix broken doctrine from people a long, long, long time ago. Happy to help you understand the mystery explained. Happy to help you to see God's wisdom hidden in plain sight. Love to do that for you. But people send me questions that want me to go debunk or re rebuke or whatever. Other people's testimony, not going to do it. There's 20,000 different ways to interpret scripture and one truth. Happy to help, see, help you to see that one truth. It's a red pill, blue pill type thing in the matrix. Pocket full of red pills if you want to do it. Otherwise, you can wake up in your bed believing that we're supposed to be baptized in water. When we, our, 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 how many times does Paul, is the, is, the, is the Greek term, is any Greek term translated repent in the Pauline epistles? New American Standard translation, zero. Zero times. Repentance. And water bab repentance is mentioned like three times in all of his letters. It can lead to, to salvation, but is not a requirement. The requirement is that you obey the gospel. Jesus Christ is Lord, Son of God. God raised him from the dead on the third day. Our redemption is in him. Our forgiveness is through his shed blood. Period. You believe that? That's how God calls us through the foolishness of the message preached, to be saved. When you add a work, when you say, oh, make Jesus Lord of your life, just say this sinner's prayer. Just do this, just do this. That's adding one little work to it, defiles the simplicity of the cross, and you baptize into the body of the Antichrist, you become a part of the mystery of iniquity. And then the veil within you becomes broken, and you cannot separate the water and the blood anymore. That's why everybody mixes their water and the blood in different ways. That's what makes the mixing the water and the blood, the kingdom and the grace doctrine together is what denominationalism is all about. So at the beginning of the day of the Lord, Elijah is going to show everybody the difference and he's going to preach kingdom doctrine. He's going to take blood, grace doctrine and throw it away. It doesn't have anything to do with them. Pauline doctrine, nothing to do with them. And it's, everybody's going to have it right for 3,000 years. They're going to be, have the gift of the Holy Spirit. They can raise the dead like on the day of Pentecost. At the end of the age, the devil's going to be released. His, he's going to have a son that's going to be the beast. They're going to have the false prophet. And they're going to go out. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to mix kingdom doctrine with grace doctrine. Just like it's happening today. And they're going to destroy many through the process of doing that. That's what's going to happen. We're going to watch all that happen from heaven. Okay, so with, with time remaining, then... Uh, 
let me see. I wanted to bring you over to, this is where I spent a lot of time, 2004, 2000. I was a member here. Let me see, am I logged in here? Yeah, see, this is me. And um, been here a long time. And if you come to ChristianForums.com, see up here, ChristianForums.com. I go to the dispensationalism room, not because I'm a dispensationalist. I, I'm, I was trained by uh, two ladies. Their husband was a dispensationalist. Five years I went to their Bible study, I outgrew them. But when I come here, the people here, I debate against dispensationalists. But I know the difference in the disp different dispensations. And dispens dispies, they call themselves, there's all different kinds of them. Traditionals. The Acts 9 guys, the Acts... If you're going to characterize me as a, as a Dispy, then I'd be an Acts 9 guy. But there's Acts 13 people, Acts 2 people, Acts 28, 28 people, the Hypers. There's all different kinds of them. They divide the Bible whenever in places it doesn't need to be divided. They, I mean, they're really into dividing God's Word. But you find some of the... I find some of the most knowledgeable Bible people of not knowing the Scriptures amongst these guys right here. So I love debating against them. But like I say, they do not count me as one, one among them. They, they, they criticize and they throw rocks at me. You know, it's pretty much like, like most people do. So I just want to go through, through these topics. And um, for example, why did Christ make man in his image? Well, first of all, God is the one speaking. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. God is speaking in Genesis 1. He rests in Genesis 2, 3. And the key for understanding there is where does he rest? He rests in his son, the Lord God of Genesis 2. A lot of people think Genesis 2 is just a retelling of Genesis 1, and it's not. God's doing the um, restoring. First of all, Genesis 1 1 was the perfect ages of singularities. The Big Bang didn't create this universe, the Big Bang destroyed the previously existing universe. God reconstituted that into the remains of what we have today. He rested in Genesis 2, 3, and then the Lord God picks up and begins his consecration work on the seventh day. So, the image thing is spirit, blood, and water. Spirit, blood, and water. Once you get that, then you realize that's what the image means. Triune. Then, uh, people define dispensationalism in many different ways. So try not to be sucked down the rabbit hole of, dispens of, of dispensationalism. But you realize that God's word must be divided because what, what is given to Israel in the Old Testament doesn't apply to you. He told Noah to go build an ark. You don't go build arks. You have to understand that his marching orders to you come from through the stewardship, the dispensation of grace given to the Apostle Paul. So Moses, the law and the prophets come through Moses for Israel. God chooses one slave to put over the rest of the slaves. That slave in the Old Testament was Moses. In the New Testament, for us, the body of Christ, it's Paul. Not worshiping Paul any more than Israel worshiped Moses. That's just the slave that God put over us. Gave him the message, gave it to us through the scriptures. In the, in the kingdom part of the New Testament, that's who? Peter. The keys of the kingdom and all that stuff. Christ was always going back to heaven. He's the Lord. The heaven is his throne. Isaiah 6, 6, 1. Earth is his footstool. That's why he made a man to be king over this universe. He's the king over heaven. He was always going back. When Christ said that they didn't recognize John the Baptist, he wasn't talking about recognizing him as Elijah. He told them over and over again he was Elijah. They didn't recognize him as the Messiah. He was the Messiah. The earthly Messiah. Jesus Christ, heavenly Messiah. That's why the Lord God made him. So where did the body of Christ begin? Where did the body of Christ begin? A lot of dispies even are going to say Acts 2. It did not begin in Acts 2. That's whenever the ministry of the Holy Spirit began. Teaching the gospel of the kingdom. Peter is going to preach the same repentance and baptism that is preached by John the Baptist in Mark 1. Check verse 4. Repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the goodness of your sins. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are three baptisms for the kingdom. John's baptism, the baptism in the name of Christ, and the baptism and laying of hands for the Holy Spirit. There's three of them. There's only one for us. When we obey the gospel, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ's body on the cross at Calvary. We become active participants in his death, burial, and resurrection. 
It's that simple. When you replace that spiritual baptism by the Holy Spirit with water, then you added the work. That's the devil's counterfeit. Do you want to try to avoid? So where did it begin? It began on the road to Damascus. The first person that was saved by God's grace and raised up was the Apostle Paul. We're raised as in the example and the pattern established by Paul, where we are murdering bad people, just like Paul, just like Saul. Whenever he stood over and watched Stephen be murdered, we're like that until the day that God knocks us down and stands us back up again after obeying, obeying the gospel. It's my writes to Timothy, First Timothy, start right at 1, 15 and 16, about how he's the first, the protos, he's the first, he's the first. He was the first, he's the pattern became the worst chief of sinner into the best. The one that he would go to try to help people and they would lead him out of the city. I've been led out of churches like Paul, but I didn't suffer near as much as Paul because they took Paul and they stripped him naked and they beat him with, with stones. And the only reason they left him is because they thought he was dead under a pile of stones. Paul get up, dust himself off, walk back into the city. So the pre-trib discussion pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, all of them are wrong. The tribulation period is the end of the age thing. Do I have that diagram pulled up for you? I think I have it. I, yeah, I have it pulled up in this, but it's down here in this timeline. See, the end of the age is way over here. The end of the age is way over here. The Great Tribulation, see it right there? Way over here. Matthew 24, verse 21. Revelation 7, 14 through 16. It's way over here. Our rapture is way over here to start the day of the Lord. So yeah, this is a pre-trib rapture. By, and this is a thousand years. This is not a thousand years. A thousand years in the Bible, that phrase is only used in two books of the Bible. Seven, Peter and Revelation. And it means so long as it takes. It's, thir it's 36 hundred years from here to here. The day of the Lord is going to be a long, long time. It's as a thousand years. Hey, my, my, um, I'm getting replies. I haven't been here in quite a while. I just haven't really had time to be able to work on this aspect of my quote unquote ministry at terrell03.com. I was putting together a, uh, a, you know, regular video to update you guys on what's going on. I said, nope. I closed all the windows. Said, we're going to get a mystery report done today if it kills me. So the, uh, what is the di the dispensational view of the times of the Gentiles? That's from, uh, Ro that's from Romans chapter 11. Until this time of the Gentiles is complete, the partial hardening has happened over Israel until this period is going through. So there's, there's different views on what that means. It says, the time that we're going through right now is a mystery time. Israel is blinded. They don't even know what's going on. But that period is going to be continued beyond the dispensation of God's grace. Continued. Because Israel doesn't even know to be jealous yet. They're not. They're going to serve um, this diagram that I showed you. Let me get back over here for a second. Oh, this is from the newsletter. Getting a little bit, a little bit of a hurry here. This was from the um, the top part, this part right here. See, this is even in the new heaven and the new earth. It should be singular here. They're going to serve David. Israel is going to serve David. There's going to be no death anymore. Remember, it goes into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. New heaven, new earth. There's no death. People still die, but not like, not like um, they die now. So how do they go to heaven? Scratch yourself on the head and just ponder that for a second. There's no death. How you go to heaven? The answer is Jacob's ladder. Mount Moriah connected to the Sea of Glass. That's why the Sea of Glass, understanding the Sea of Glass, is very important. Especially you get more advanced in your development. Some are going to serve as priests. Some are going to serve as prophets. They're going to mature. David's going to look at him and say, hey, son, you're done. Off you go. He's going to go up. At the same time he's walking up to this, the descending angel, his angel half is going to descend down from the heavens. They're going to serve. They served David for who knows how long. Then they're going to serve the lamb on that sea of glass for God knows how long. All right. Then at the end of the age, they're going to go to a lots of the end of the ages 
before they finally are going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's right for this what's one that's coming up, Revelation 19, sort of five. So they get their angel half and their man half hooked back together again. You know how they do that? They're going to walk into the Lamb. When they walk into the Lamb, this is the incarnation of heaven. They're going to appear with us in Christ Jesus. And then their eyes are going to pop right out of their heads. Because by that time, we have matured and matured and matured age after age after age after age. And whenever they get there, they're just like a little chicken in the chicken house. If you ever raised chickens before, like I have many times, you always have the little chicken on the bottom of the totem pole with no tail feathers because all the other chickens pull their tail feathers out. Then you got the ones with the beautiful plumage on the top because they impress the rooster. That's part of the pecking order. How it works. It's, this is the same thing. The body of Christ has a pecking order. Some of us have great adornment. Some, some of us have big crowns, big rings, staff, big giant stones in our staff and all kinds of nice stuff. Some of us just have a little silver ring on our finger. All right, But whenever the, these that come up the food chain for the Water Witness Avenue through Israel, the priesthood, they are going to be made so jealous whenever they finally meet us. That's what I mean. This time of the Gentiles, it, it ends with the, whenever the rapture happens and the last preacher is taken in a way. But with the God's lesson of making Israel jealous, that part of that dispensational thingy, that continues on for the ages and the ages and the ages. So it's an individual thing. The sooner they meet us in Christ Jesus, the sooner that they're made jealous beyond our ability to even fathom. And they carry that back with them all the way to the infinite realm. The thing is, this isn't going to sound nice, but the thing is that everyone that's coming up the food chain through works, God has an issue with over idolatry in the infinite realm. So that's the thing. And whenever he, uh, Christ is given the lesson about moving mountains and said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could move mountains and everything. Christ never envisioned mountains being moved by men. People get the, the message wrong. The message is that you have no faith. You have zero faith. None. That's what he was telling Peter, John, and James. Think about how many times he told Peter, John, and James that I will be raised on the third day. Just go through the account of Matthew. You'll see three different times. Christ says that what's going to happen to him, how he's going to suffer, the Son of Man's going to suffer, and then he's going to be raised on the third day. He told him over and over and over again. Imagine if it's mentioned three times over that three-year period in, in the account of Matthew, how many times he really told them. Probably 50 times. And whenever the third day came, how many of his 12 were standing there? Well, minus Judas, obviously. But how many were standing there? Zero. They were crying in the upper room. Because you know why? Because they had no faith. Zero. That's why the chapter of Mark 16 does not appear in some of the manuscripts. Because somebody had to pull it out of there because it demonstrates the faithlessness of the 12. That's the reason why. Only women were there. And the women that were there had spices and herbs and stuff for anointing the body. Those And people think how great that is. No, that's not great. Those spices and herbs represented their faithlessness. Why would you need them if he's standing there? If he's going to be standing there looking at you, you didn't need them. Right? The whole lesson around Israel is their faithlessness and their idolatry. Go back to the Old Testament, Moses, and the reason that the ground had to be opened up and swallow lots of them idolatry. And every time Moses would leave, they'd have a, a calf. They would have some kind of golden calf or some crazy stuff going on. But that is the key there. That's why uh, the, the Paul says that women, body of Christ women, you're supposed to keep, pray with your head covered for a reason. That represents the veil between earth and heaven because you're water witnesses. And that's the reason he says because of the angels at the end because they're spirit witnesses and your man is the image and the glory of God. You're supposed to use your man like an angel. But Israel... Even the men have to, they pray with their head covered for a reason. All these things make sense when we get onto the other side of the veil. And we see from, as members of Christ's body, how God deals with Israel. And the mighty angels look over our shoulder and see how he deals with us versus how he deals with Israel. One's coming by works, one's coming by grace. So that's, um, that's what I want to share with you. If you have, um, questions and you're doing your own research and you don't even want to be a subscriber or something like, hey, I understand. Then you may want to come to ChristianForums.com, 
See, this is the name of it, ChristianForge.com. And you can see my name here. It's Terrell. I'm a senior member. I've been here for, since 2004. And wrote here mostly before I started the 9-11 investigation in 2010. No, 2006 I started that. So I continued to write here until heavily until about 2010, if, if memory serves. So you can find not just on this website, but I wrote on a lot of them, Christian Forums com and theologyweb.org and against all kind debated against all different kinds of uh, professing Christians. So if you'll Google my name and a topic, chances are you can find where I wrote on something. I'm going back in time. So um, I'll just just before I go, then this lady here, this is Marilyn. She's a newbie, and uh, she wrote. I was kind of, and I went through to see if anybody's writing on my threads before I started this video, and. Uh, so this is on my uh, The Kingdom Bride versus the Body of Christ. And she says, I agree with most of what you wrote, which is great to hear. Good truth that is much needed today as we come to the final maturing of the body. He's going right to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, that is actually going to, the maturing of the body is minuscule on this planet, minuscule. That happens throughout the ages. It's going to mature much through this 3,000 year period in heaven, but still this is just a warm up for what's going on in New Jerusalem. So now, just a small detail. I was taught that Israel under Christ will have a king and there will be priests also. Well, that's true. Go to the Old Testament, start Ezekiel chapter 34, start at verse 22. And you'll see that David is going to feed them himself. Through this period that's about to come up, David's going to feed them himself. Then you're going to see a dozen mentions of desolation from Ezekiel 34, 35, 36 until the bones are raised up and David is raised again. Jeremiah chapter 37 through 9. The Lord God's going to raise David up forever. So if you when you go to Ezekiel 37 and start at 24, read 24 to 28, you'll see that David himself, he's king now and he's going to rule forever. That's the new heaven and new earth. So this David walking around on the earth, he's going to lead Israel. He's going to feed Israel himself. Guess who he is? He's Elijah coming to restore all things. Same guy. They're all skins for the same guy, our father Adam, who's been, been dealt with by the Lord God in these different skins moving through the Old Testament. And once you see the different identities, David and Bathsheba, Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Adam and Eve, Moses and Joshua, Adam and Eve. God keeps doing this over and over again. He's been dealing with these this pair because he's restoring the one son of God. Eventually, Moses and Elijah become one again. One. Moses goes back inside the side of Elijah, which is Eve going back in the side of Adam, reversing what happened in Genesis 2, 18 through 20. I know how that sounds, but I want you to hear what I'm saying because you're going to be my witnesses later in the, in, in the timeline. God's going to bring all these things up, all these things. And then... Some of us have it right, and some of us don't have it right. And, if, and seeing the truth is a blessing. It's a great thing. But sharing the truth with others whenever we're covered with this veil of darkness, that's truly a glorious thing. And that's something for which we are going to be rewarded. And I expect to get the big cheese reward. So I'm going out. I'm happy to go out on limbs and tell you things that sound kind of crazy. John the Baptist did the same thing. Lots of people thought he was crazy. And he had the Holy Spirit from the in his in his mother's womb. So then, uh, yes, there's going to be have a king. He's going to be on the earth, and the Lamb of God's going to be in heaven doing the same thing. It's going to be on earth as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven, type of thing. So the Lord is the head, the high priest, and the king. And uh, thus, another of the differences between Israel's rulership and the body of Christ's rulership. Yes, Peter said, "You are a royal priesthood." But we know that his inheritance is in New Jerusalem, while the body of Christ's inheritance is in the third heaven on Christ's own throne. Um, thing is, New Jerusalem is in the third heaven. We have an inheritance in New Jerusalem, too. And it's like a giant pyramid. And the higher you are up in that pyramid, the higher you're up in the pecking order. The nicer place you got, let's put it that way. If you're a common stone down on the bottom, then you're going to have like an apartment. If you have a really great position up top near Paul and Timothy, Titus, Barnabas and all that, then you have like a, uh, well, it's just glorious. The ones that are up on top have so much more than the ones on the bottom. 
That's why you want to run the races to win. It really means a lot. And many people don't realize that you're in a competition. That's why Paul says, don't box this as beating air. Run the races to win. There's only one reward given and you want to go for it. Second place doesn't mean anything. You want to be first. So uh, th the difference here is that Peter, John, and James, they have an inheritance all right, but it's outside the blood witness section of New Jerusalem. It's in the water witness section. It's beyond a wall. And outside that wall is all water witnesses. They, can, they will not even have access unless we lead them by the hand and we don't let go of their hand until we take them back out that door in the heaven realm. So there's a central blood witness section that where we have a, a an inheritance in that it's comparative to the mountain of God in the infinite realm, but it's like a pyramid there. Christ is the head. You want to be up near as Christ as possible. So then, um, um, I think that's all I want to share. Notice the word you and not we showing Peter is not referring to himself of that group. Peter is a member of the kingdom bride. He's obeyed the gospel of the kingdom. He found the things uh, of, the of the wisdom given him with Paul hard to understand. Couldn't understand it. He couldn't get the gospel right. That's why Paul is rebuking him in second, uh, Galatians 2, start at 11. By the time you get to 14, Paul is rebuking Peter. Peter didn't get it. And he was a leader of the kingdom disciples. The rest of them didn't get it. Paul had to go submit the gospel that he preached among the Gentiles because Peter, John, and James thought that he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom to Gentiles and that they were all coming into their church. They weren't. This is a whole different dispensation. A different gospel. Gospel of the uncircumcised, Paul calls it. Second, uh, Galatians 2, start at 7. And he compares that to the gospel to the circumcised, which is the gospel of the kingdom. Two different gospels even though the scriptures are written to kind of conceal that from the wicked. The scripture is written to be interpreted that many different ways so that God can reveal the truth to the sons of God and then the sons of darkness can interpret it 20,000 different ways. And everybody's happy as a lark to go along their way. But since you know there are so many different um, denominations and one truth, then you should be on to the fact that it's being the mystery of iniquity is at work, forcing those to believe people to believe what's false. And there's only one truth. Choose your tutors wisely. Check everything out for yourself. Do your own research, just like with everything else. Don't trust anybody on the Internet. But then go to check in the Scriptures to see what if, what, if what I'm saying is true. And check out the um, introductory videos right over here. Go through them one at a time and see if everything that I'm saying. There's a video... And that inside the description box is going to take you to ChristianForums.com or somebody somewhere else. And you can go through the post and then you're going to see my arguments against those that disagree with me. See if my arguments hold up or if they do not. So that's um, what I want to share with you. Kind of a lengthy update. Wanted to give you and Trevor plenty of background information about what I'm trying to share with you. My apologies for being slow about getting the mystery reports out and doing my very best. And... Um, we are on the, looks like we're on the precipice of an October event that's coming up. It looks like that it's, we're in the calm right before that storm. We'll see how things shake out literally here soon. And I appreciate your support. Get more information at the website. And I'll see you on the next update report.